break um, over the summer and the Prelude Festival where we presented uh, a work in progress from New York City artists, uh, 13 curators uh, selected um, actually um, 20 works and uh, and it was a, a chain curation where one curator selected the next one and um, we uh, was I think a very inspiring model and we are now back to um, our talks our university theater our space which actually is called the Siegel Theater a small uh, black box in, but actually it's brown it's still uh, closed for public uh, programs we cannot go in still fast it's very complicated we get testing every week and uh, especially Significant object. Your internet connection is unstable. I hope I didn't uh, miss too much. I don't know what happened. Um, the um, internet went out. Um, so um, I hope we are alive here. Um, this oh, no, if I'm back, uh, yeah. I, apo I apo I'm back. I apologize. I don't know exactly what that was. Maybe someone doesn't want us uh, to, the, to, to, to create the program. But anyway, we are truly um, um, am happy to have you guys here with us. It's an important moment for us um, to um, restart um, this season. And um, I apologize for that disappearance in the in the digital um, um, space. I'm going to read uh, shortly uh, about uh, the project, which we're going to talk about. It's called The Walk, an amazing project. Many say the most probably the biggest or one of the biggest, if not the biggest worldwide uh, theater production, theatrical production this year. And then I will read a little bit about uh, Basil and uh, Adrian about their work. And then we start. They just came back on Monday from this uh, very long um, uh, uh, talk. Uh, a walk uh, and uh, through, um, I think, uh, if I'm right, eight countries and 140 uh, stops with Amal, a large scale puppet, a nine year old Syrian refugee girl. And we will hear how it went, how it walked. We actually happened to have uh, Basil and Adrian with us the day before the whole uh, walk started on our whole round for India. So it's incredible for us to be on the bookend um, of, of this project. So Basil and Adrian, first of all, how are you? And welcome, and thank you for joining us. No, we're very well, thank you. I'm Adrian. <laughs> and I'm Basil, and we are thrilled to be back um, talking to you now at the end of the walk. We can tell you all about how it went, and uh, we're very, very, very thankful that uh, the whole walk survived COVID, which, which uh, really was uh, something of a miracle and due to the great diligence of the organizers. And with incredible rain across incredible. Europe. It's yeah. it's a stunning what you did. So let me read to our listeners uh, who might not all be um, uh, familiar with it. Um, so the walk, a giant puppet of a nine-year-old refugee girl with the name Amal, traveled four thousand nine hundred miles, about eight thousand kilometers, uh, from Turkey-Syria border through Europe, all of Europe to the UK. And the team, the Good Chance team, it's called, that created also that brilliant performance, The Jungle, that um, Susan showed us at St. N here in, uh, in, uh, in New York City. Um, the production that celebrated 
the celebrated production of the dramatization of the refugee life in Calais, a, a village, a refugee village that for a moment existed and then was destroyed. And that was the memories about what people experienced. I saw that it was truly um, a significant work. The same team uh, uh, invited Basil and Adrian, who are in New York, more famous for the War Horse, uh, a puppets they created for the production of War Horse, which if I remember right from the book was the story how an animal looks at war. It ended up by the National Theater, a little bit like a story of a little white boy and how he experienced it. But um, the, the puppets were the stars of the show, but their work, um, the Truce Commission, Wojciech and the Truce Commission and uh, so many others. The work with Kendrich is brilliant. It's uh, stunning. One of the great works of the 20th and 21st centuries in theater, I think. And, but anyway, this walk dramatized the story of refugee children, and there are millions of them right now, as we speak, um, all over the world. And uh, they used a 3.5 meter high uh, puppet, which means like, I don't know, uh, 12 foot high, I guess. Um, um, it was called Amal, and she traveled from the Syrian border through Turkey, Greece, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, Belgium, and France in search of her mother. More than 70 towns, villages, and cities welcomed Amal with art from major street parties and city performances to more intimate community events. In July, little Amal arrived at the Manchester International Festival where she became a centerpiece of a large scale participatory event. The production team included director Stephen Daldry who said it would be a, a traveling festival of art and hope and the most ambitious public art event ever uh, attempted. And, um, and uh, David Lan, who also helped to produce it, the great David Lan, who said, you know, we don't want to forget the girl or the little girls, the refugee children say, don't forget us. And I think you uh, made that happen. So a little bit about Basil Jones is a very long, what we could say, but he's the co-founder and executive producer of the Handspring Puppet Company. And uh, he uh, completed his BFA at, uh, UCT, which is the University of Cape, Cape, Town? Town. Cape Town, right, where he met uh, his uh, future mm -hmm. husband, Adrian Kohler, who is with us. They are a family business in the good old sense of a living theater and, uh, and uh, where they collaborate to, uh, together. Um, he set up the uh, Handspring Trust, the nonprofit trust in 1990, which produced the award-winning Spiders Place, an innovative multimedia educational series for television and radio and uh, aimed at young learners from disadvantaged backgrounds. Just for us to think about this were intended audiences in the very beginning. He set up the Handspring Awards for Puppetry, which recognizes, encourages puppet design, direction and performance in South Africa. The Handspring Trust is involved in a number of performance projects in urban townships and rural areas using puppetry as means to educate and empower use theater in a sense, but especially here the puppets and he speaks and writes on the subject of puppetry and is deeply interested. Um, he received the uh, Naledi Executive Director's Award, uh, Lifetime Achievement Award from the Chobane University and Honorary Doctorate Degree in Literature from the University um, of Cape Town and uh, their productions. Um, uh, as we said before, have been um, significant, influential and changed the face um, actually of puppetry and what we think about the art of uh, puppetry. Adrian Kohler is the co-founder, as we said before, with uh, Basel and, uh, and he is one of the world's leading masters of the medium and also in creating um, the puppets. His mother was an amateur puppeteer, so he continues actually the family, family business. And, uh, and his father was a yacht builder, a ship builder and cabinet maker. And that gave him a grounding in woodwork, wood carving, wooden construction, and the creation of moving figures. And so uh, very connected to what we always say that theater is connected to the craft, that mentorship is involved, whether it's families, like old traditional theater in Japan, it were families. Also, they were the traveling companies in 19th century, in, for example, in Germany, you know, where the craft was transmitted and used yeah, by the next generation, but it came from parents or you joined a company, you didn't really went um, to um, university. He um, actually also studied at the Cape Town University, spent time at the Space Theater, South Africa's pioneering non-racial theater. 
And it's important note also to say that Handspring Company was influential, significant, and important in the time of the fight against the apartheid regime. We had an earlier Siegel talk, you can go back to it, but if you really wonder what can theater do, um, and uh, uh, th this is something to look at and to understand uh, their work and also the idea of what Basel said. Well, you know, if your puppet says something, you can't really sue the puppet, you know, it's not so easy. So they can do something. There's a space there and they um, created it. Um, Adrian uh, spent a year then uh, also at the Botswana National Popular Theatres Program and he was a member of the Midu Arts Ensemble. He and Basel returned to Cape Town in 81 and founded Handspring Puppet a Company uh, with two other of their graduates, which also shows you, you know, people at universities, your best friends or the people you're next to you, you create work with the people you have, as Brecht says, you build the house with the stones you have. It's a real model. If you want to start theater, I want to do theater, look at what these guys did in their life. It's astonishing and, um, and amazing. And um, Adrian was the lead puppet designer and maker as well as the designer and script writer. He got many, many awards. Warhorse, of course, became world famous. The Evening Standard Critics Circle, Laurence Olivier Award in London, brought on Broadway a special Tony Award. And little Joey was, uh, you know, as close uh, as to a, a, a theater god uh, in an animal form one could be in New York a City. I think uh, people came out to touch even the little horse and uh, children and, and people who saw that um, great show, actually. His work has been exhibited at the National Gallery, the Barbican Art Gallery, at the National Theatre in London, the Museum for African Art, New York City, in Cape Town, of course, Johannesburg. And his puppets are in co collections at the Munich Stadt Museum, the South African Constitutional Court, Centre for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And he's the recipient of Vita Awards, Artist Award, and the Michaelis Prize, an honorary doctorate in literature at the University of Cape Town, and the John F. Kennedy Gold Medal in the arts. Well, here we go. So you guys are so highly uh, decorated and for good reasons, even so puppetry often is a little bit more in the shadows. Um, you have really brought the art form forward and created something that uh, is um, outstanding. So Basil, Adrian, um, you are just back from, how long was it? Two and a half months or three months were you away? Tell us, but how does it feel? We were away for nearly five months, uh, Frank. Uh, we started in Turkey, in quarantine. We spent our first two weeks in, in, in a hotel looking at the Mediterranean, uh, but unable to, uh, to leave our hotel room for two weeks, uh, having all our food brought to us um, in the hotel room. And Adrian and I, particularly Adrian, uh, glued to our TV set all day um, uh, watching and participating in rehearsals for Amal happening in London. So we went to work every day in London, but we were in Turkey. And we never left the room. <laughs> That's <laughs> incredible. Room. For how long? For how long? That, that, that was for, I think, about two weeks for the duration of our quarantine. Um, because the whole thing happened like that, because as South Africans there was a ban on South Africans traveling to the UK at the time. Um, although our, our COVID numbers were coming down and were, were better than the UK figures, um, I think that news hadn't got through to the UK yet. Um, so we were, we were, were there and, and they changed the rehearsal venue from London to Turkey. And the whole team uh, then shifted into an, a, an empty hotel where they had a ballroom. Um, the temperatures outside were 41, 42. Um, and it was, ex uh, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but very hot. Um, the 90s so almost, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the, the inside the hotel was a lot cooler and the, the space was huge. Um, so we had, a, we had a very convenient rehearsal time there. That lasted about a month. And then we traveled across Turkey. The walk started. And we traveled across Turkey. We, we started we started in Gaziantep, which is a, a Turkish city fairly close to the Syrian border. Um, and it's a city which which many 
uh, Syrian refugees aim for as their first port of call, and many of them never leave. So um, on her first night, her very first, uh, at the start of the whole walk, um, she was um, she was led through the Syrian section, the, the narrow streets, the Syrian section of Gaziantep, and um, uh, led by by Syrian children into a large square where there was um, a, a, a big crowd and lots of lights, lots of lanterns, and above us a great fortress, the the fort, fortress of Gaziantep, Gaziantep. Um, uh, which was also lit up with uh, projections. This, of course, had all been managed by good chance and by Nazir. Uh, Nazir, um, who is the artistic director of the whole walk, he's uh, Palestinian. And, Nazir, uh, uh, yeah, Amir Zouabi. Nazir Suabi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he is a man of great imagination and fortitude and determination. He, uh, he worked a non-stop every minute of every day for the entire walk. Um, we couldn't believe his, his energy and, uh, and his, his great dedication. He said, I am a man, and because he is also uh, a kind of refugee. So yeah. um, it, it was a great start. The, the people of the uh, the Syrian people of Gaziantep really understood her immediately. Uh, um, and at the end of it all, we were taking the puppet down and putting her back into the truck that she travels in. And a woman um, came up to us standing outside the truck and uh, she had traveled five hours to come to see Amal. And she brought children, sort of young teenagers, some girls with veils. Um, they'd had to get special permission to leave their parents, um, but she brought them all. There were about 30 of them uh, all this way. Incredible. And she, said, and she said tonight, thank you. Thank you very much for this, this experience. With tears uh, in her eyes. Yeah, she, she was nearly weeping. And she said, tonight you, you have allowed me to forget Aleppo. Um, and uh, I think to... The, the kind of metaphorical nature or the, 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 the puppet representing something means that you, 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 it's not like only a personal experience. It, it belongs to all of those people who were watching and all of those people who were no longer in the lip. Incredible. Maybe we can world. look at a little bit. I don't know. Do you have something from the moment? I know Andy is with us. Um, he has the Instagram side. Do you have something from that beginning or another clip so our audience can see? There, um, there, there um, are some, yeah. And yeah, could you change the very beginning of the Instagram um, postings? Yeah. Andy, could you share, uh, if you hear us, um, some of if not, if not, we come um, um, back to it later. Um, yeah, here we go. So um, let's see where that would be more on here you see uh, the puppet amal on the top right how large she really is and the and the and the photograph okay yeah that's her um the, the photograph in the middle between amal and the map that is a, a still from yeah. the jungle that you mentioned that's the jungle production yeah and, and that that little girl is the is the little girl that Amal was modeled on. Uh, there is an eight-year-old girl in uh, that production. So we tell a little bit, what was the idea? How, how, that's incredible, like a piece of a performance inspired you, a character to create something. Tell us a little bit. How did that well, happen? She was, she was in the production. She, she, her, as a character, she never spoke. She was always, you know, simply the little girl. Um, but David Land had the idea to, to take this um, mute character from the play um, and make the puppet. Um, so, so he, and he proposed it to the Good Chance um, boys, Joe, the two Joes. And um, so the pro- well, I'm not sure. I, I think 
David wanted to make a war from Syria to the UK, uh, to the UK across Europe. And the two Joes at good chance wanted to make a giant puppet. But we, this was before us. And uh, yeah. so we're not sure about how exactly that idea evolved. Yeah. But in fact, we've never seen the jungle because it didn't come to South Africa. <laughs> so, mm. so, you know, we were simply sent photographs of Little Amal when we were asked to make the puppet. Mm -hmm. so, so can we see a, can we maybe see her walking um if that's possible on the instagram or maybe uh, in some of the whatsapp messages yeah. we send not uh, that, not not that one that's, these are early ones that's too early she was modified carry after on that. no you're going in the down wrong downwards uh, and in the other direction. Direction. other direction these were the rehearsals in the hotel you know that's the prototype as well um more oh okay is that yeah. a there, that's, that that's, can't be all. No, there, you would have to get to another page. It's on another yeah. page. This is all very early stuff before we arrived in 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 Turkey. Uh -huh. um, uh, this you're so, going backwards in time. Yeah. I'm so Andy, uh, maybe go off for the moment. Uh, see if uh, you uh, find that, it. That uh, something from the messages, and let's let's talk um, a, a little bit more about. Um, the 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 concept why do you think a gigantic puppet made out of wood and cardboard and fabric how, why is that better than a film or what a theater a playwright why you know it, it seems to be you know the emotional response but it's working why do you think um it got such a response why wh what is that what is it uh, i mean first of all she's in the same space as you watching, you know, it's, it's, it's the reason I suppose why we after working with television have stuck really with live theater is because the, the moment in which you're performing in front of a live audience, there's an electricity between you and them that doesn't exist in the cinema in the same way. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, she is not real. She's three and a half meters tall. Um, she's 12 feet tall. Um, and she's, you can see the puppeteer inside her chest working her and the puppeteer's outside. So she's, she's an artificial um, um, performer. And she invites the audience to fill in all the gaps to, to recreate her in their own imagination, I think. Um, she can walk and she can smile and she can look with her eyes and she can move in a fairly convincing naturalistic way. And so she's, she's I mean, Basil calls the, her an empathy machine. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think, I think partially it's, a, it's very much a two way, um, uh, two way activity of, of creating life. The, 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 first of all, obviously, the designer, Adrian, has to make, make this machine that is very lifelike in its movement. So the, the structure of the, the machine and the way it moves uh, is, is, a, is, a, uh, is, a, is about creating life. But then next thing is the puppeteers who have to take this machine and make it move uh, in, a, in a gorgeously authentic way. And that takes a, a, a lot of work because um, it's, it's not easy movement. It's, it's very um, subtle movement based on breath. This is one of the early um, things that we learned in our company uh, in, well, in the late 90s, uh, 98 run, when we did our first opera, we, we learned about breath and how important it was uh, and, and how one cannot ignore tiny movements. In fact, it became clear to us that tiny movements and subtle movements based on breath are the most, um, are, are the most essential uh, movements for, for, for authenticity in, 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 a, in a puppet. And, and it's, there's a whole vocabulary or a language of breath. Um, so then that is another way of bringing this puppet to life. But then from the audience's point of view, they, their desire for her to be alive 
adds to her life and and amplifies her life um, as as experienced by them. So there's a very great desire, I think, for the audiences on the street, for her to live, for her to be who they have come to see, for her to be a living being. And they, uh, a lot of people, um, when they see her, talk to her face, talk to her eyes, and they can see the puppeteer inside, they can see uh, that she is being manipulated by somebody. They, they know that she's not real, yet they give her reality. It's a donation from them to her, which is a donation that we all make in, in the theater always, um, but it's, it's become in a way clarified and essentialized in these live uh, street performances where there are uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands of people who all want her to live. I suppose they all bring their own stories as well. You know, yeah. as, as, as she walks across her, her 8,000 kilometer journey, um, the story of her walk is following and, and growing in size because of the numbers who have seen her. But each refugee person and each person who is empathetic to the, to the plight of refugees uh, comes there with their own story. And so uh, because we retained the muteness of the original Amal in the play, that she doesn't actually speak, that she only speaks with her body. Um, she's in a way completely uncontaminated by controversial uh, utterances that she might have uh, had have had to say. Um, and so you can impose all of yours onto her. Um, yeah, there's a tremendous projection um, onto her by the people who see her. Um, and, and many people, uh, uh, say, like uh, Naz uh, Nazir, I am Amal, I, 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 I feel I am her. Um, and a woman, a woman that Adrian saw in Coventry, for instance, was standing in the background uh, with a bouquet of white daisies. Um, and, and she slowly made her way up uh, towards the puppet and eventually was right in front of her. Yeah, and, uh, and in her other hand, she had a little note, a little card, hand-painted, um, and she was not a young woman. She was a woman who was nearly as old as me, and, uh, and she found, us, found her position in front of the puppet. It was not always easy to get there because of the, the crush. And because people are trying to keep you away from the puppet mm -hmm. because the puppet can't really move if it's completely... Uh, encircled by people. And she found her space and looking with this very kind of, it's hard to describe the look on her face, but it was one of almost like rapture, um, looking at the face of the puppet and handing her the, the, the flowers and handing her the card. And fortunately, the puppeteers know how to do take them from her. So wow. they, they, mm -hmm. they accept, the puppet accepts gifts really well. Um, and she had her, her own moment in the middle of a great crowd of people alone with the puppet. It, it, and it was, I eventually was able to meet her because she impressed me so much. Somebody knew her that I knew. Um, and, uh, and turned out that she works with refugees in England. Um, she's hugely involved in their stories. So this moment was, was her sort of talking to the puppet in her private capacity. <laughs> and, it, and it struck me that, that people in, can invest a huge amount of belief, which is kind of maybe dangerous even, but um, a belief that, they, that she can somehow hear them and, and can somehow take on um, your needs of her. So she's, you know, we, we, of course, we, we don't really understand exactly what has been happening. Um, and we're grappling with it now, and we, we're trying to begin to create a, um, a group of scholars who will think about what giant puppets are doing, um, what they can be doing, giving some sort of um, critical feedback to the people who are, are actually involved in making them and performing them, because um, when you come to think of it, there, there are actually a lot of giant puppets around, um, but there's not much um, 
there's, there, there's not much discussion about what they do, why they do it, understanding really of, of what it means when you take a, a something that's of a statue, uh, statue dimensions, um, like a large public figure, that, that the large public figures that we see a lot of are statues. Um, and um, what happens when you make that statue move? Um, and, and, and how different is it from uh, seeing uh, religious icons moved through the streets, which, which of course, many people in many cultures, we have moved religious icons through streets with great crowds of people. That's something that, that is very much part of our past. And we kind of, we, we, we grappling with our, our attempts to understand um, what she is and how, you know, there seems to be a very real um, religious dimension to this. We, many of us have lost our faith, but we haven't lost our hope. And she is hope. She, her name is Amal, which is, is Arabic for hope. I think a lot of, a lot of um, migrants and refugees and people who've come to a new country uh, who's starting afresh, they need hope. Um, and, and she represents hope to them and to us all. Yeah, it's incredibly um, impressive um, what you, what you um, created with that. Uh, it reminds me, you talked about that she's kind of a machine. It's working, I think, Heinrich von Kleist in his famous essay on marionette theater. Actually, it's mostly mistranslated, but he, he talks about the machinist. You know, as the puppet player, he's a, he says he's the machinist who knows, and the and the puppet doesn't make any unnecessary movements. You know, it yeah. follows physical physics and rules, and um, and um, so um, and I remember Basil many many years ago you came to the Siegel one of our great evenings and you talked about the what puppets can do and he said think about the holy trinity painters have tried to do it right the father and the son and the holy ghost on a painting it just never looks right it looks odd but if you have a puppet it's not a life but she's moved by two people who are behind it you know and um but you don't see them they are so they are in black but they don't see feel alive but the puppet so something happens the moment of an opening for um for um learning for a recognition and a kind of, you know, uh, a wonder, a sense of wonder, you know, that's why hypnotists like to do a little explosion, a sound, a lightning, because, you know, you for a moment, you see, what's, is that real, what's happening? And that it, uh, understanding is allowed. And large scale puppets, I mean, I have never seen something um, in that thing like this, um, seem to be doing something. And you really uh, found that. I remember also you said there are puppet companies in Ghana, right? There was large scale puppets, like it's an African tradition also. Yeah. You inspired yeah. in your work with Kendrick, Kendrich. Particularly in West Africa, we, we for, for many years, right from our time in Botswana, um, uh, you know, had a huge admiration for the, the Malian puppets of, of Mali and the Bambara puppets of Mali, who um, they do use large outdoor figures. Um, and, it, and it goes back many centuries, that tradition. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very ancient African tradition as well. Um, you know, I just getting back to the construction of this one, um, what we've discovered is that the choices we made to have her work by an, an, a puppeteer on stilts uh, um, with only external manipulators working the arms. Four people many, move the puppet, right? There, there are three, uh, unless the weather is bad, there's a fourth right. person who supports her with the rod to the back of her um, in case there, if there's wind um, or if the terrain is a bit uneven, um, she needs that's extra security. Um, but because, because her, her technology is very simple, really, um, she doesn't have great big machines. She doesn't have um, computer-driven everything. Um, she's, she's really very analog, very um, direct, right. controlled by the people working her. She can respond immediately to anything that comes at her in the street. Um, and, and that turned out to be a huge advantage because um, we do have an external uh, director 
in contact with the radio to the person inside the puppet who can see more than the puppeteer can in the, in the moment. And he's saying there's a little child over there that's itching to, to be recognized by you. Or there's, a, there's a, a, an old lady up on the balcony who's been watching from behind a curtain. Go and look at her and go and greet her. Um, there, there is an outside eye that's directing the actions of the puppet all the time. Um, uh, but the basics of her are very simple. And what what actually happened? Uh, you know, it's it's the basics being simple. It's true she is simple, but you are walking on stilts and you cannot feel the ground with your feet. So if there is a stone or uh, or a, any kind, you can't you can't also see your feet. And one of the things that you have to understand, I'm just going to go down here now. The head is up here, um, directly above your head. So um, you are, you've got in your hands some, some, uh, some strings, uh, tough strings, that you are pulling. When you pull uh, on the string, uh, the head can turn uh, left or right, uh, nod up or down. But also there's, there's a top lip uh, which can lift up and, um, and smile. But um, it, they wanted that. Uh, Good chance wanted that, and Adrian said, "You know, smiles with puppets can be become a grimace very easily. They are tricky to do. Um, so this top lip you can move up, and so it does this. Okay, so that looks terrible, but if the top lip just does this, um, shows a little bit of teeth. a little a little bit of teeth that much, um, then it looks like a smile." So you are you are you you've got something here which is moving the eyes left and right and up and down. Mm -hmm. um, you can also blink her, um, but all of this you are doing with the head up here. You cannot see where it is looking. Um, yeah, you cannot you cannot know that <clears throat> you've been asked to go and talk to the lady uh, in the up uh, in the first floor um, window who's hiding behind the curtain. But you don't know if your head is um, is actually looking at the lady, exactly. or looking past her, or down below her with your eyes. So part of the the month of rehearsals is taking already very experienced puppeteers. Quite a lot of them were warhorse puppeteers who had had years of experience in warhorse mm -hmm. and came to the show, uh, uh, came to this rehearsal period with, with great experience. But some of them were newbies who, um, who had, uh, you know- no, we, had, no, we had an acrobat from, from Ethiopia, a Syrian ref re refugee actor from, from Paris. He was originally from Syria, obviously. Um, so they had some, some, uh, you know, the acrobat had some background in in uh, in being able to work with the body for sure, but it was a real learning process. And in the beginning, when we were in Gaziantep, um, everyone was scared of being in the puppet. Um, some people remained scared uh, for much of the walk, but slowly, slowly, everyone became more and more able to forget the, uh, the mechanics and really work uh, freely in the moment and be able yeah. to uh, dance and do amazing things. Um, yeah, the the, the Gaziantep walk, the, the first night was quite terrifying, you know, from a, from a, from a, from a performance point of view because- Over the bridge, you know, right? Yeah, it was before that even, it, it was before the bridge, uh, but nobody knew what, the response of the public was going to be. Yeah. We'd, we'd actually, we'd rehearsed riots. We'd rehearsed naughty children running under the legs of the puppet and chased by a parent, you know, who might upset everything. And um, we tried to anticipate what might happen in the street, but nobody knew. Um, and so they were prepared, but, you know, it, it was pretty scary. And very, very little um, has, has happened to her. From, from the crowd she's worked it, It's in. incredible. And, you know, I want to also point out the scope and the risk um, in a way and the concept of this 
great project. By the way, someone said the humans are the only animals who show their teeth when they smile. You know, <laughs> all, all the all animals don't do that. It's a something interesting what you what you touched on there, and you know, knowing about Japanese bunraku theater where you. In the first three years or four years, you're just allowed to maybe move a leg a little, you know, it takes a decade for training. You know, this is a great craft. Um, so I also want to point out, this is a, what often we think of theater in the traditional way is, you know, you write a play and then some actors re learn the lines and they rehearse, they go in a theater and then it's going to be shown. People buy tickets, they like it and they go out. This is a socially engaged, participatory artwork outside mm. in actually nature where um, you cannot uh, control the surroundings mm. um, where you actually touch on one of the most highly controversial political issues of our time mm. like uh, even perhaps more emotional in climate change they have been um, uh, killings you know uh, motivated again there's violence against refugees um, it is a theme that our society has to confront and it tries to and, uh, and it has to discuss it and work through. You took that on and you said, we're not going to write a play. We're not going to make a film. We create a 12 foot puppet and we walk 8,000 uh, kilometers or put it through. You had a team of four puppeteers. You prepared for it. You wrote the script, you had 12 people preparing the events. This is not also just casual, but the engagement with the audience was also work and part of the artistic work, if I understand right. Also vastly expensive was a $3 million project, you know, which is nothing compared to a film, which is nothing compared to TV and how many people watched it. But I want to turn out, this is an incredibly ambitious project. I think it's a avant-garde in the sense of it's a step ahead and points to all theater and performance maker also as a way of making a meaningful artwork. So I would like to hear from you a little bit about the, that operation that, you know, uh, almost sounds like a campaign, a military campaign, or I don't know, how did yeah. you plan that? How could you take on such a big project and have the hope it work out? I, th I think everybody leapt into it not knowing exactly what was coming at them. Um, you, you know, the, 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 the scale of it only really presented itself as we went along. And of course, um, COVID multiplied the problems immensely because the whole team, every single person had to be uh, tested every two days all the way along the walk. Um, we were incredibly lucky in that we only had two incidents of COVID uh, during rehearsals, one of the puppeteers got COVID, and fortunately, no one else got it. He was isolated for two weeks. He had to stay behind in the hotel where we were rehearsing, and we carried on. So he missed the, the, the beginning, the opening, but he rejoined us. Mm -hmm. And then there was one more incident, but we were, we were adamant all the time to keep separate. To We traveled uh, each puppetry team. There were two te major teams. Uh, five and four, there were nine puppeteers actually, um, and they traveled in separate vehicles. Um, and the, um, the organizing team traveled in another vehicle. Uh, the, the documentary team traveled in yet another doc, uh, vehicle. We had, um, we had an Instagram documentary team and a long form documentary team. Um, and a, a, a stills photographer. So with it, there were three forms of documentation happening. And in Turkey, uh, curiously enough, we had an ambulance. So uh, we had uh, two trucks for the, for the puppets to go in, uh, four vehicles or five and an ambulance because for something like this, uh, you have to travel in Turkey anyway, something as big as we were doing, you have to travel uh, with, with an ambulance. So, so uh, the, and that's just the crew that's moving. Um, the, in each of the towns, in each of the countries actually, there was a, a, a local producer who was, whose job it was to coordinate all of the welcome events. So you, if you can imagine every single day, there's a new event. And the people, you know, and or three or three presenting the event have, have been rehearsing it for maybe months beforehand. 
Um, so the, the local producers combined with our producers, um, and Nizar and Tracy Seward, uh, were challenged. Each place, each little town, each little village, maybe a refugee uh, camp, were challenged. How would you welcome little Amal when she comes to visit you? And, and there were many different answers to that, to that challenge. Uh, uh, there were dances, there were food festivals, there were speeches, poetry, um, many times other puppets were brought in, uh, big and small. Um, on one occasion when she arrived in uh, Chios in Greece, um, there were about six different little, it was a theater festival. So they were uh, along the way, along the, the, um, the, harbor, the harbor wall and harbor walk, uh, there were six different musical groups and they had a fantastic idea. One one song, one melody, and each group was playing that melody in a different way as she arrived and would greet her with that music. And there were some basic words in uh, Greek, obviously. And then that group would follow her. And, and to the, as she came to the next group, the same music would be playing and all the groups would move together following her. Um, led by drummers and trumpeters. One of the groups was a, a, a group of, of refugee teenagers from the camp who were let out for that day. Um, they normally, the camps are kept isolated in Greece, um, but they were let out and they had an incredible, they practiced a whole rhythm thing with cardboard boxes as their drums and they followed her with those. Um, and then every, everyone, that evening gathered in the town square and there was a big musical thing and there was a huge uh, lit uh, ball of light um, like the earth and um, and different people read poetry or made speeches and uh, it was a big celebrate musical celebration so that was one instance but there are many many different ones one that we witnessed in Marseille where um, one of the groups of uh, young refugees had uh, came out with masks on, um, sort of African masks, and we we wondered what that meant, and we were told, uh, no, they are undocumented uh, uh, children. children, and they may not be seen, um, and so that was there. Mm. They had a real reason for for wearing a mask, but they, but to join in the in the event meant they had to wear the mask. They couldn't be, they couldn't walk in the event without a mask. Maybe you should talk about the Paris. But a mask as a face mask, not a corona mask. And yeah, a, face a, mask. a face mask in the shape of like an a animal. neutral Lecoq or um, yeah. uh, there were, yeah. were, were elephant. No, there were animals. There was like oh, an animals. elephant. There was a lion. <clears throat> uh, also in, in, in Marseille, um, there is a beach. There is a, a small beach in, you know, as part of the city, um, which is a contested beach. On the one side of the beach is a very uh, elaborate swimming club. Closed off to the rest of the world, you have to be a member. It's ex extremely expensive to belong. Only Olympic swimmers you know, kind of swim there, or it's like a very exclusive club. Next door to that, they were building a, a a very expensive hotel. And the hotel had, uh, I don't know, bribed or uh, had managed to acquire the beach um, mm -hmm. next to it. Um, and the, the citizens of Marseille already pissed off that the swimming club was so exclusive. Now the whole beach was going to be taken as made a private beach for the hotel. So they there was huge protests about it. They won the beach back. And so everybody who swims there regularly every day is incredibly proud of the effort that they put in to keeping this beach a public beach. Then uh, a, a, a quite an ambitious dance piece for Amal had been designed for on that beach. Um, a Palestinian uh, choreographer uh, had got um, her own team of, of uh, professional dancers plus 80 amateur dancers were going to participate in the event on this beach and they wanted to rehearse it the day before on the beach 
And so they came with a small group of professional dancers and cleared a space amongst the people there. And there was huge objection to their presence. They said, this is our beach. You can't just push your way in here. What the hell do you think you're doing? Um, they, they were adamant. They tried, they started rehearsing in a smaller place. And then eventually the crowd allowed them to continue their rehearsals. And then afterwards they said, so what's this all about? Um, there, there's going to be a, an event here tomorrow. And every single one of those people turned up with a performance the next day. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge crowd on the beach. Uh, uh, that, that to see a, a live dance piece on a beach with a big puppet in it, and it was the, one of the major themes, visual themes of the dance piece was all of the dancers were wearing orange life jackets. And the piece ended when they all had to go into the sea and they released all of their life jackets and swam away. And all of these life jackets were left floating on the water and Amal was just looking at them from the beach. And then she turned away and left the beach and the crowd parted as she went. Um, that, that that was one of the one of the highlights for me of the whole walk. What you know, we, and so we had both the performance about refugees, but you also had the story of the beach, which resonated with the people mm -hmm. of Marseille. One well, one of the things that I think we began to see um, and became became aware of that you know a friend of mine, a puppeteer who who was in another show we were doing, he said. Uh, yeah, she's meeting all these Jude Law and the Pope and, and so on. It looks like a bit of a gimmick sometimes. And I said, you know, what you don't see is when she is walking in the back streets of a town, uh, again, like Marseille, uh, she went to, she passed a, a, a junior school um, in Marseille where a lot of Syrian refugees uh, uh, were, were learning. And they all lined the streets uh, and they were shouting, Amal, 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 Amal. And they were donating to her their soft toys. Um, and we, we, our organizers ended up with an armful of soft toys that these children had, had, had insisted on giving to, to Amal. It, it, the, these toys, are, they're, not, they're not spoiled kids. This is a special thing for, for them. So that degree of identity is, is amazing. Um, but more particularly in, in the center of towns, what you're beginning to see, and this was very apparent in England, um, you were seeing people coming from different immigrationary origins, um, from Syria, from Bosnia, from Ethiopia, Jamaica, Somalia, all together in the center of the town um, all sharing their um, experience or, or, or thinking about their experience of being um, uh, illegitimate in a, in a new environment, but somehow legitimized by this figure who was, who was walking with them and, um, and um, speaking to them through her um, very eloquent body language. We, we were, I think, seeing for the first time their realization that they are not separate, that they are, that the, the category of being a migrant or being a, uh, someone who's descended from migrancy is something that binds us all together. Not, um, you, you're not just existing in a town where you only see your own Bosnian uh, friends or your own Somalian friends. Here we had all migrants coming together for the first time um, and realizing that they are, are a new category of, of person in a way. And a lot of people beginning to talk about the fact that we are all migrants, we all were migrants. Um, we were riding in a taxi uh, in one town and the, mic the guy said to us, uh, uh, he said, uh, my parents came here in the 50s and they were um, they, they were sort of doing, they were cleaners. He's now a taxi driver, but he said, um, my daughter is studying medicine and my son is, is a geographer. Um, so, you know, this kind of beginning of the realization that, that we're all migrants and that migrancy can start in a very humble way in a city, 
but it begins to, uh, the migrants begin to become major cooperators and contributors to the societies where they um, have, have arrived into. Yeah. By and large, somebody who, who has the resources to abandon the life they had, however destroyed it was, but it is resourceful enough to leave and to, to go through the difficulties. Sometimes it's a year before they arrive anywhere. Um, uh, they, they, they are survivors, they, they have overcome many, many difficulties before they find a place yeah. to sit. <clears throat> yeah. And and so I, yeah, and I think um, um, in a way the history of mankind is a history of migration. Uh, the great BBC documentary, Journey of Mankind, uh, made clear that racism, not only morally, ethically, politically, is despicable, um, it, it proved the oldest DNA, if that is still true, you know, is the Kalahari Bushman um, from Africa. The entire mankind uh, comes, you know, from that group of people. There's some immigrated, 10, 12, 15 of them. So then they stayed in Europe, then some went on, some went to Australia, some to Asia. Over the Bering Sea, the Siberian hunters went into um, uh, in North America, most probably 10, 12, 15 of them. And the entire history of mankind is a history of migration. And, um, and I think uh, that also what you, you show in your work uh, and you make it um, a visible. And also it's a fact we have to live with and art has to prepare us for the future, make us comfortable with the future. And I think one of the great um, um, uh, results of this project is that people say, yeah, it's not so bad. You know, we have people from different neighborhoods, different countries, and there's a puppet and there's a dance. You know, why should we only be Hungarians, live next to Hungarians in a Hungarian town, listen to Hungarian music and wearing the Hungarian, you know, traditional clothing? Maybe there's more fun to be next to someone from India with the, Hung with the Indian traditional clothing and the listening to their music, you know, and it's a fact anyway, it has happened. What, but... If I remember right there, not all were welcoming all communities. There were also um, complications. I know the Pope, which most head of states try very hard to get to and often uh, don't, uh, don't uh, have success, but Amal met him and he was kind to her. Um, but we also heard of throwing stones or tear gas or people not allowing you to work, which also shows this is something real. This is not just, you know, some kind of beautification and wallpaper for a downtown uh, uh, soulless neighborhood to bring a little bit of art in. This is something serious. Tell us a little bit about the complex re reactions. Yeah, I, I suppose, uh, you know, she, she didn't have a 100% smooth ride. Um, and, and there were these incidents they, they were, however, not very many at all. Very, they very were, few, yeah. Out of 140 few. stops, yeah. Yeah, and, and for, for anybody trying to, to make a story out of her journey, they're actually very useful because they, are, they, they give a bit of conflict to the story. Um, but uh, in, in, in Greece, it was the first time. It was Larissa. Yeah. Uh, the the right-wing uh, fascists in Larissa uh, were demonstrating against her and uh, threw tomatoes and eggs at her she, uh, and, and at the puppeteers. And the, I'm not sure the name of the place, but there's a wonderful, wonderful beautiful area of uh, Greece where there are kind of uh, small mountains and there uh, monasteries. monasteries on the top of the mountains. And Mount Athos. The, Mount Athos? No, no, it wasn't Atos, there. it's another place. Of another mm -hmm. place. Um, but it's, it's incredibly beautiful. And they're all uh, Greek Orthodox monasteries up there. And the, the bishop uh, of the monastery would not allow her to pass by the monastery on the grounds that she was Muslim. And he felt it was inappropriate for a Muslim person to be permitted to go past his uh, uh, Christian citadel, which uh, was... Uh, there, there were a lot of... The response from the left in Greece, by the way, there were a lot of satirical uh, uh, cartoons about these people throwing stones at Amal and uh, the stupid bishop who was making ridiculous assertions. Yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean that a puppet can also be Muslim is a very odd concept too. Like the, you know, we've, it's we've taking, never... taking it so literally that you know that um, yeah. Well, it was it was 
uh, good that he was treating her as as real. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but the worst thing I think that happened in a way was what happened in Coventry. We were in, the, in, in, in Birmingham, sorry. Um, when we were in the march, um, we didn't see it happen, but uh, Nazir told us about it. Adrian, you can... Yeah, yeah. He, he, she was about to turn into a shopping center where the main performances yes, were going to happen. And he saw this guy come running out of the crowd um, and as he got to Amal, he threw a bucket of marbles at her feet, which would have, you know, which would have, if she'd stepped wow. on the marble, mm -hmm. there were children all around, she would have crashed into, and there could have been a terrible accident. Um, and so he just told her to freeze and she stopped moving. She just hadn't stood on the marbles yet. And there were lots of little Syrian children around and they started picking up marbles like fury. And, um, and then they're all standing saying, what should we do in Arabic? He said, are we allowed to keep them? <laughs> and uh, Nazir said, like, just stick them in your pockets. The, the marbles disappeared like in two seconds, they were gone. And great image. Saying, great image. But it was, it was a pretty horrific thing to do and would have required planning and some financial investment to buy uh, all those marbles. And uh, yeah, so, uh, there is that that dimension, but it, fortunately, uh, it was rare. Now tell us about meeting the Pope. How did that happen? Did the Etwans <laughs> team just call him up and say, Amal is coming and the Vatican that, prepared festivities? How, what happened? I suppose there, there, there are sort of almost myths around that now, but um, Tracy Seward is, a, is one of the producers of the Netflix movie, The Two Popes. Um, and... Um, and but uh, David Land says he knows a, a cardinal. Um, he knows somebody who works for a Catholic charity who has access to a cardinal, who has access to the Pope. Probably um, somewhat private. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, you know, what that, was that? We didn't hear that. You were whispering. <laughs> well, we, 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 we're we, not 100% sure. Uh, you know, if it's true, sure, if it's private it's information. Very, uh, very. Uh, uh, complex piece of diplomacy, but yes, um, because because but, it, the Pope must not be uh, made fun of. No. So there, there there has to be some level of security or assuredness that this is not going to be a joke. And and he he spoke he, he spoke to Amal as as it as talking to her face and uh, a cardinal one of the cardinals in the Vatican also read a long speech to her uh, that day. And when she went to Westminster Cathedral, which is the Catholic Cathedral in London, um, a cardinal made a beautiful speech to her, which um, uh, I, I would love to get a trans, uh, 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 what's it text on. Um, but um, yeah, she's, she's uh, it's been amazing how, um, how she was accepted by, um, by religious figures. And the doors were big enough for her to walk through and... Yeah, yeah, she liked big doors. <laughs> there is, we didn't mention that uh, for every outing that she makes, there's a recce beforehand uh, by the puppetry directors and uh, Nizar, uh, obviously. Um, Nizar and Tracy Seward have done the whole walk already, um, uh, you know, last year. But every day there's a there's a recce. The puppeteers don't have to go on the recce because that would exhaust them if they had to go. Recce means record, record, the recon or uh, like, yeah, recon recon recon. research and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we check on all those things. We have to make sure that there are uh, there's a toilet nearby. Um, in certain circumstances, there there are two puppets. We haven't mentioned this, but uh, when there's a very long walk. Um, there'll be a, pu a puppet hiding here. Um, and uh, the one puppet comes, uh, walks and walks and walks, maybe a kilometer. Then we'll go up a little alleyway and the second puppet will go walking out on the other side. Um, so we need to find out if the, the, those things traffic, uh, traffic and, and we need to talk to the police, to the traffic department. Um, then there are many things that, uh, 
are, are part of the preparation for for every walk. So yeah. how much did she really walk of those, or did you drive in between? How much walking was yeah. really walking, walking? The original concept of, of her was she was going to walk all, uh, but it would have taken two years. Two years, um, yes. Yeah, um, yeah and, and the original concept was that we were all going to be in tents. Uh, we, uh, and, and one uh, sort of rock, rock um, how do you describe it? Like, like a rock tour bus. You know, a rock tour bus with, with bunks in with it. Bunks in yeah. it. Like the grateful it. dad, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, setting up every night on the on the peripheries with of the, town with a food and, wagon, and, you know, and all the local the, food and what what and and mm -hmm. uh, you know, like a lovely romantic idea. There was, you know, we even had graphics of the kind of camps we would have, but the reality of that is, you know, to find a piece of land in any big yeah. city that's anywhere close to where the events have to happen. Um, Parking for all the vehicles, yeah. setting up maybe in the rain, <laughs> uh, taking down maybe in the rain. You know, uh, that, the food doesn't work. Uh, people need Wi-Fi. Uh, the toilets are non-functional. Um, so we had to have uh, we had to have professional hotels, and because we had to be able to move in and move out uh, at difficult times. Sometimes the puppeteers would arrive at one o'clock in the morning after a long drive. Um, so your, your question is how much of the walk, uh, how much did she walk? The answer is she walked um, very little in between towns, although she, she did walk in some landscapes, but with um, 90 cities in, uh, sorry, 90 days and 65 cities, I think, um, her walking took the walking took place in the cities, really through the cities. And Still enormous. Through, it's enormous. Um, but you know, it they, wasn't it wasn't a, a walk that went across great uh, landscapes because she walk, she takes about forty minutes to walk one kilometer. Mm -hmm. Oh so, yeah, and you know if you imagine the kind of red tape that you have to have in advance prepared in advance to even walk in any street in a city. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, you have to have police, you know, there have to be uh, some level of crowd control. Um, so the police were, have been incredibly well co uh, co cooperating with the event in every country. Um, and it's, it was so charming. Like, so the police have also in each town are anticipating her arrival. And in Coventry that same day, uh, a lot happened there. Um, she, the, the, the police were standing in a in a sort of casual huddle um, while the, the puppeteers were getting into the puppet, and uh, and this this one policewoman was on the edge of them, and she saw the transformation from the, the sort of object being put on the puppet. You know, first of all the, the stilts puppeteer. and the object being put on the puppeteer, and s suddenly. This little girl came to life and walked over to this policewoman and put her hands on her shoulders, and she just burst into tears. <laughs> and this, uh, the, the, you know, uh, that's the last thing I expected from a police a, a police person. You know, they're, they're normally so firm and sort of confident mm. in the kind of job they have to do. She just melted. Incredible. It's almost like a Tour de France that also doesn't really is one tour. You go, you have a stop, then the buses take you, the bike, they go a little while. How many people you involved? Uh, administration, artists, and dancers. We were, but it's, it, it's stunning. We were, we were 32 people uh, all together, including uh, the photography team of, of 10 uh, and nine puppeteers. And all the, the other people were producers and, and organizers. Um, yeah, and, and you know, uh, and there's, there is a sort of disjunction between the touring party and the, and the producers' work. In Coventry, again, they, they, they had made a, a beautiful dance piece on the steps of the cathedral between the bomb, the cathedral that was destroyed in the second. The bombed out War. cathedral, like the, the Benjamin bomb. Britten memorial yeah, composition, yeah. you know. And the one next to it, um, and uh, you know, they mm -hmm. their their piece was about how uh, the city after the Second World War, which was uh, flattened, um, has become 
in the empty space of the city has become a place where migrants have been welcomed and are now, you know, doctors and nurses in the national health system. Um, and, um, and, and they, you know, they showed movies of the destruction and, um, and, uh, and a lot of the people were in the performance were refugees. And after the show, all of the good chance people went back to the hotel and the people in the performance who'd been rehearsing this piece for a couple of months um, said, we're having a big party, where are you going? And, and why aren't you joining us now? Um, you know, we've done this for you. And the, the truth of the matter is you can't stick around. You know, you're on the bus, you're off to the next town. And yeah. you, you know, they have to have their party alone. Um, but I think what she left behind there was a group of people who had worked extremely hard and extremely in, a, in an extremely focused way on making a lovely production that really worked in the site. But it was about the subject of refugees and yeah. and the and the rebuilding of a city with people who came after the destruction. And I should say that that in that uh, that ru partially ruined cathedral that afternoon. Uh, the mayor of Coventry had bestowed British citizenship on a group of, uh, of former refugees, um, uh, children, um, and included in that group was little Amal, and she now has a, an official uh, document signed by the mayor uh, uh, affirming the fact that she is a British citizen. <laughs> Incredible. This is incredible. So also, you made, if I see it right, 140 stops in those 90 places. So you created communities of people who work together to welcome her. Is that right? Like people who prepared oh, for a long time. Thousands yeah. and thousands and thousands of, of children have made cards, have made puppets, have heard stories about refugees, have uh, come out into the streets and welcomed her. Uh, Many children across the whole of Europe now understand something about uh, what what it means to be a refugee, and and how to respond to refugees when they meet them, and not in the idea of victimization of over and over seeing images, you know, of uh, sure. uh, of sure. abuse and violence, but uh, you created, uh, uh, as you would say, an almost a spiritual uh, uh, a figure of hope, you know, and, uh, yeah. and, and um, I, that I, is... I we, we were, Adrian and I were the two aunties in the background all the time. We had uh, nothing to do with all this amazing organization. We were witnesses. Of course, we, uh, we made the little amal, but um, we've sometimes felt a little like spare parts uh, uh, in those circumstances, because we were, we were really uh, just in in the background. Yeah, uh, people that we have worked with, you know, who know our method were the puppetry directors on this piece, um, so we weren't doing that. Uh, we are incredibly proud of the work that they've done on the wall, um, and uh, and they've done it, you know, every day relentlessly, um, because the puppetry directors Craig Leo and Enrico Way. Um, mm -hmm. they, 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 yeah. they were officially had Mondays off, um, but in fact, uh, days off never materialized for the people like Nizar, who were constantly on yeah. to the next, the next event. Incredible. Yeah, we, we have a discussion at the Siegel Center also how we go forward after our, that time of Corona, of all the talks we did with over 200 artists. And one of our ideas will be to do, uh, you know, next year a festival in New York parks without electricity. Actually, Amal also is a thing that we're without it. But the idea is that artists, in a way, you know, say, who can we do this? We don't have the money. Can we pay? Is it say so in a way artists become almost like activists now? They are like, and I think maybe this is also a call to artists, like climate change activists who are out there, you know. 
um, yeah. who, who have, really been... put the, their life out. So also perhaps artists uh, now are, it's also about doing art, but it's also an activism to, you know, be dedicated um, um, to a cause, to open minds, to hold up the significance of the of art in the in society and that we can work through problems and through complications and through contradictions without look at it from different uh, per, angles without that we solve it but uh, theater and performance is one of the um, uh, possibilities and and I admire your project I didn't want to say it's not good to write a play about this or a poem or a mu mu movie or make a painting they're all of it like it's a big museum there are many rooms where you can express art um, but I think this is something um, extraordinary, what you created that somehow, yeah, is something that is so very much connected uh, uh, to our, um, our time. The chain, the chain is Joe Murphy and Joe Robertson, these two young British writers, um, went to the camp in Calais. In Calais, yeah. They saw the need for a kind of a, a communal space they built a geodesic dome there, which they found in Scotland, um, and they got the people of the camp to erect it. It became a meeting place for musicians and poets, and eventually a play, um, which caught fire with the, the, the young, the uh, serious, experienced uh, directors um, uh, became interested. Stephen Daldry would come along, you know, so the people well connected to the movie industry and to finance in theater came along. Um, and so, and, and then it grew into the walk. And so there were people with connections who could make it happen. And as a result, although it was a very expensive exercise, it was free to every single person who came. Incredible, to yeah. Right across Europe. Um, yeah, right this is the, also uh, important to point out, and I forgot to point that out. It was a free participatory socially engaged art theater performance puppet e event. Do you have very roughly numbers of how many people were involved preparing? How many people watched? Is there any way to? I think they're gonna do the sums now, you know, in the, in the, in. They, they, they know that their donors want to know, um, uh, the funders will want to have an evaluation, but we don't, we don't have numbers yet, uh, but, one thing is, uh, is one of our hopes, in a way, is to bring Amal to New York next year. Tell us a bit. Really, that's a fantastic uh, prospect. How, how will that happen? I, 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 you know, it's too early to say. Yeah. But I think that she's had invitations from all over the world. Many, many yeah. people want her to visit them. Many people feel that, that it's important that they come to where they are whether it's Australia or, or Cape Town or um, uh, South America, or uh, th there are many invitations. But uh, the one that, that I think is going to become a reality uh, is, is uh, Little Amal visiting New York City. That would be that would be a fabulous idea. It's also a city, you know, uh, of immigrants. It celebrates immigration, but also experiences the problem. Perhaps it's a step ahead of many European cities in in, in its openness, also of the problem. But also, I think 160 languages um, are spoken, and um, yeah. and um, and it is. You know, people uh, people are saying uh, we have Biden for three years, but uh, there's no. No knowing what's going to be happening in America beyond that time, and yeah. I think this is uh, an urgent, uh, an urgent thing that needs to happen. Is that people need to understand what migrancy is about and learn um, how to engage in a in a creative way with uh, with people who are coming into their society from other societies. Yeah, yeah, and also New York City is alive. It's so beautiful and fascinating because of the population, because of the people here and not uh, because they don't come here. So it's, um, and, and I think New York City has learned that lesson. It's very serious about it. Even so, you know, it is of course um, challenged like never, um, like never before. That would be just brilliant. So keep us uh, posted of maybe we finally gonna have a cup of tea in person and you might come earlier to New York then I'll make it to Cape Town. I really would love um, to come um, and visit you. Another thought in visual arts, 
is an art form that's called almost like instruction based art. And we once had at our Prelude Festival a performance, Claire Bishop brought it to us, a German uh, artist. It was a take a dancer, he has to be retired. Um, he has three hours in a space. We would like for him to remember all the dance steps he made in his life. But he can do it whenever he wants. He can sit down and get up, and he is not allowed to rehearse. You know, and this is her conceptual art piece. So she writes it on a piece of paper with 10 rules, and then you can do it. Do, do you think um, a mall after in New York or some marquee events which you prepare really well, is that also something where you say, yes, it could be an instruction-based piece like a play that's been written and then people are like, okay, you can perform it and, uh, and stage it in Paris and never like the old fashioned traditional idea of theater. Yeah, it, 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 I, I, I suppose, you know, it, there are people with imaginations all over the place and um, hopefully the street will, it is going to become a, a more used space for performance. I think in South America, in South America, there's a there's a, there's a lot more. In in Argentina, there's a big tradition, um, and you know we don't have it as much. But I, I think that Frank is saying, could she perform a play? That I mean, oh. uh, or could her walk? You say you can do the walk in India, in uh, Australia. Just follow these rules. Would you say oh. go ahead? We give you permission, or the producers. Yeah, I think I think one of the rules, if 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 you, if if they're going to be writing root, the rules, one of the rules of of this walk was um, that she's not she's not setting out to make any political points. She's all she's asking is that you welcome her, um, and she wants to have fun. And she wants to have fun. So that that meant that in Greece, when there was they they wanted her on a particular square where the, the, the fascists and the anti-fascists were gonna meet one another over her. Um, they wanted Amal to be there. And they, they, they were insisting to the walk organizers that she must be there. And the walk said, no, um, she's not gonna be there. She's not there to be the center of a conflict. First of all, it's dangerous. There's somebody up on stilts. Um, but second of all, um, you know, she's going to make all the wrong headlines in the, in the mm -hmm. press. Um, so the, the, the anti-fascists were very cross that she didn't come. Uh, but in fact, she did come. She came in, she managed to find her way onto the top floor of one of the buildings that looked down on the square. They had lights on her and she did come, but she wasn't right in the center right there. of where they yeah. could have been in the middle. And her hope and her vision is to unite, to build bridges, to connect, and not to divide, and to yeah. you know, and to be a, a symbol for a starting of a fight. It's uh, truly um, incredible. I remember Basil, you know, you had your 70th birthday, um, which we celebrated when you shortly before the walk started on the uh, how long for India. As a final question, how, how where does this piece fit in for both of you, also Adrian, in your body of work you have done incredible um, outstanding work um war Horse, the truth commission work so many other things work with um kendridge now, how do you how, where do you situate it uh, is it uh, one just one like the other projects or is it special um, or is it the same when you started out to make small uh, puppet plays about same-sex relations and apartheid which was a very dangerous time thing to do well, it's, you know, we, we, we're not quite sure what to think about it. I think it's really important when you make art, not necessarily to have an idea of what its meaning is before you've started to do it. And, and, and most of our understanding of what we've done and what we've achieved is always in retrospect. Um, so we're a little bit still too close to yeah. this to really know what its meaning is for us. But um, looking back, we we were recently reminded that we made a giant puppet for the first uh, gay and lesbian march in in South Africa. Um, mm, we, 1990. In 1990, mm. um, mm -hmm. Johannesburg, um, we were um, 
friends with Simon and Corley, um, who in that time had organized uh, a group in that area called GLOW, um, the Gay and Lesbian Organization of the Witwatersrand. We were trying to um, get, a const uh, get a clause about gay rights written into the constitution. And um, he was working with Edwin Cameron, who was a, um, a, he became a judge, but at that time he was a lecturer at the university in, in law at the University of the Witwatersrand, the two of them, um, Simon had been accused of treason and he was in, in prison for treason. Um, and in prison, he came out as gay to his compatriots, uh, to, to the other prisoners in the ANC. And they initially spurned him, but eventually embraced him. So he and Edwin went to Mandela and, and, and persuaded Mandela to, um, to include a, 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 a clause about gay rights into our constitution, an incredibly important thing that they did. And we, it was at that time that the first march was, was organized and Simon was behind it. And we made uh, a giant bird for, we were asked to make a giant dove uh, for that, uh, that occasion. And Adrian said, I don't want to make a dove because it's it's got it's too overladen with Christian symbolism. I'd rather make a cattle egret. And so he made a very beautiful cattle egret, a giant cattle egret, which was part of that march. So that was our first uh, giant puppet. And um, and it 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 was somewhat forgotten, um, but now someone is writing about it, and uh, mm -hmm. it, we we realized that it was. His choice um, to make a cattle egret rather than a dove made it an, a, a characteristically African puppet um, and it was actually a better choice than uh, had it been a dove with its easy symbolism. Yeah. Um, so where it fits, where, where the walk fits, uh, I'm not sure. We've obviously always been uh, people that are very politically uh, involved in some way or another with our work. But I think we've also always said that it's also perfectly uh, okay and important to make plays that are just fun and, and not necessarily having any political objectives at all. Um, so it's just that a lot of our work has been, has had um, uh, some social connection. I, I mean, it does feel like we are entering an era when, um, you, you know, the, the industrial complex is so powerful um, that the important issues of the day are being swept under the carpet with rhetoric. Um, yeah. I mean, it seems like COP26 is a, has been useless again, mm. um, despite the enormous uh, groundswell of opposition to the petrochemical industry and um, and the great power blocks of the world. True. Um, yeah. We we are defenseless. They, um, you know, the Russians are about to, you know, sort of dig for oil in the Antarctic. Um, and uh, uh, you know, what do we do? I mean, are we just going to sit back and let them? Um, is it is is it our job to fight against them? It's seems like an impossible fight to win. Um, but uh, what is the role of arts in this new change, this new chain of events? I think COVID has given us a chance at least to sit back and think about it. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it, after, after the fall of apartheid, all of the, the air went out of our theater work for a while because it, uh, the, the struggle theater in South Africa had been very strong. Um, and, and suddenly there was no need for it any longer. Um, but now is a time when um, all of us you know, in, in the humanities have to be questioning what's going on. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, and, I, and I think we, we do need big gestures, big 
things uh, for the time we live in it has to be visible. It can no longer be a little blurb in between commercials on television that's mediated. I think what you guys did it truly um, is a visionary, um, but everyone can have ideas. I have a lot of ideas. I struggle to put them you know, into life and that the ideas of David Lam and the people behind the jungle, you making it happen, the advanced team, Amir, who by the way, also was in our Siegel talks, um, and that they, you know, made that happen. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, uh, um, event. It gives us actually hope, and um, and Amal uh, will be with us. Uh, once I googled Amal, and then George Clooney's Amal came up, who gives gave him hope in his <laughs> life. He said, uh, and actually, I sent it around. I wanted to send around your link to our people of the for our book talks, and somehow. I didn't think so. At the Times mixed it up. They all got the Amal Clooney mail. Um, <laughs> but there is something hopeful and there's something different. And also, you know, in, in a way, her work um, uh, for human rights, there's something where we are all connected. So really, really, um, it's, it's so inspiring. I would also like to let you know that your work inspired us also to be a bit more proactive. We have been great friends of puppetry. We think this is such a significant art form over centuries. We have also published plays, yeah, Turkish uh, uh, puppet plays, a uh, place from the 12th century in Egypt. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but um, also now with Claudia Ornstein, we will, it was like a final push also talking with you and made it a non-brainer. We will create a puppetry international research academic journal. And uh, there is no global interdisciplinary academic journal that is dedicated to puppetry and the allied arts of mass performing objects and material performance, um, as Claudia wrote. So we will try to create a, a, a journal that will report on this. And hopefully there will be a special issue about your uh, work. It will start in 23, maybe it could be um, an initial one. Claudia Ornstein will be um, the lead um, editor and it will also be critical reviews of plays and books. So it will uh, also establish you know, this important field of theater, which over centuries and over all continents has been so important um, to have a, um, have a closer look. We are coming to the end of time. We actually went uh, very much um, over our time. And um, I just would like to get to the list of, um, uh, hopefully I have it here, of uh, our Siegel talks. It hasn't been announced yet. We will do it uh, on on Saturday, we will have book talks. So many uh, of our participants uh, in the Siegel talks over the last year uh, were also writers. A lot of them were women writers actually, and somehow uh, a generation of them finished in the time of COVID books. So we will talk with Bonnie Maranka about her book, Timelines, Writing and Conversations, Teresa Smalik about Ron Water, the life of an actor with the water, who very beloved, great actor, um, Alexis Green and Emily Mann will talk about the book about Emily Mann, the rebel artist in the American theater. Uh, Carrie Perloff will be back and talk about her book, uh, Pinter and Stoppard, a director's view. And, and Catania on her book, she finished in the time of COVID, the art of dramaturgy and inside look. And Bogart will um, talk about the art of resonance on directing and what theater needs. And I think your work is something where resonated she talks about resonance, that perhaps this is something we should be thinking about. How much does it really resonate? And I think your work really is there. And then Avra Isiri Dolupolu and uh, Frank Radabats, Radatz from Berlin, she's from Greece. Uh, they will talk about uh, her new book, Staging 21st Century Tragedies, Theater Politics, Global Crisis. And Frank Radatz will talk about her new uh, theater uh, research center at the Humboldt um, university and looking at this uh, changing times where we are and what we should be doing. So, um, so when we felt your project was so significant, uh, what you dreamed up and then also implemented is so big, we wanted to start with you guys. So really, thank you for sharing. Uh, and I can't believe you just got back on Monday as uh, so you barely over jet lag forever. If there was one, no, most probably not to South Africa, but still, um, uh, some of your clothes must still be in the washer. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, being such a good friend of the center. Y your work is uh, significant. We look up to you, but the service you did, you know, also to refugee girls around the world, refugee children and refugees themselves, um, you know, how you change people's lives and perspectives is uh, extraordinary. And I think it is what we need um, at that time. So thank you. Thank you both. Thanks for HowlRound, Thea and Vijay for hosting us. Andy and Tanvi here at the Siegel team. 
and I hope you will join us on November 22nd uh, for our next talk. But uh, all the best, and I wish I could be there and have a, a, a glass of wine or a, a, a cup of tea with you guys. And then one day I will come and visit you, and you're such an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And thank you for keeping this great uh, international dialogue going. It's really important. And what you're doing for puppetry also uh, uh, is, is going to be wonderful to watch. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, Basil. Basil, bye-bye, Adrian. And uh, to bye. our listeners, thank you for taking time. We know how much is out there online. When we started our talks last March, not so much was there. Now there is a lot uh, out there, so it means a lot for us and you take your time and uh, and listen to us bye 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 thank you bye